Hello and welcome to the regular school committee meeting on Thursday, March 12th, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. Uh, let me open tonight with, should we do the audit first? Is that okay? Or? Yeah. All right. We'll go around. We have a round of art this time from the Pierce Elementary School. So on board A, back over there. We have emotion paintings by the kindergarten. After talking with what emotion means and what kinds of emotions we experience, kindergarten artists learned how many colors can portray emotion in artwork. Students looked at fa famous works of art and discussed how certain colors, lines, and shapes made them feel in the art. Students then used colors, lines, and shapes to express one more or more emotions using paint, oil, pastels, and cut out shapes. Finally, students gave their artwork a title. And board B, those are mood monsters by the second grade. Students painted and collaged mood monsters. After learning how color can portray different emotions, we looked at the artwork by a variety of artists, including George O'Keefe, Pablo Picasso, and Mark Rothko. Students reflected how certain colors made each of them feel and how, each, and how we each attach different feelings to different colors. After talking about different emotions, students chose one and mixed colors to match that mood and then created different tints of that color in their backgrounds. Students created collage monsters by cutting out shapes from color paper that matched the chosen mood and gluing the monsters in the background. Finally, students wrote short biographies about their monsters. Or C, planning and process. Connecting to the habit of mind, vision, and understanding our own. Students learn how, to, how artists plan out their ideas before starting a creative project. Students are encouraged to brainstorm, plan, and sketch out a few ideas before beginning a final project. This gives them the opportunity to think about potential obstacles that may, they may come across. Some students end up sticking to the original idea, while others come, uh, come up with new ones as they work. Fifth graders created surreal shadow boxes with found objects inspired by artist Joseph Cornell that depict a dream or a nightmare. Second graders assembled their very own dream spaces with paper plates and painted cardstock paper. They filled up their dream spaces with pop-up st style drawings of things they love. Third, gra third graders learned about designs and how they educate the public about the artist's interests or passions. Students created multi-page mini pamphlets designs where they are experts on or what they like to do. For D, those are Mandela's by the fourth grade. Fourth grade artists learned about radial symmetry and pattern by creating mandalas. Students learn about the importance of symbolism of mandalas in different cultures and how creating mandalas can be used as a tool for me meditation and increasing self-awareness. Students were shown a video of the Tibetan Buddhist ritual of creating sand mandalas which, in which intricate, intricate mandalas are made with sand and then destroyed after they have served their purpose. The underlying message of the ceremony is that nothing is permanent. Students then drew their own mandalas by using repeated patterns. There was, they were encouraged to take symbols that hold unique meaning in their lives, as well as experiment with different patterns and lines. <coughs> and back on board E, those are self-portraits. Uh, grade, uh, grades K through five learned about self-portraits and how different artists use self-portraits to express their identity. Students were shown, artists, were shown portlet, portraits by multiple <coughs> artists, classic and contemporary. Kindergarten and first grade artists learned about Frida Kahlo and made self-portraits inspired by the book Frida and her Anim Animalitos. Students learned about Frida's love of na nature and animals and how she included both in her self-portraits. Second and third graders were asked the question, what is your superpower, and created superhero self-portraits that depicted what they would look like as a superhero. Students drew their self-portraits in the style of comic book covers considering what they would wear as a superhero and what their superhero name would be. Fourth and fifth grade artists were shown the artwork of portrait artists and discussed how artists used elements such as symbolism in color to represent who they, who they are. Students then painted self-portraits that express their identities through symbolism, color, and backgrounds. Congratulations to all the pierced artists. <coughs> All right, and then public comment. We have uh, Lynn Klosterman on the list for, come on up. I'll be very brief, thank you, and um, thank you for 
entertaining me for a few more minutes. Sure. Um, I, I was selected to be the representative tonight, lucky me. Um, while my husband's trying to pull together a quick online for his evening, two, Thursday night evening classes at Northeastern, so he's trying to pull that together tonight. <laughs> um, so I, you know, instead of going over the same stuff you've been hearing, I just thought I'd share a quick little story about um, what started us here at Arlington High with the ski team. Back in 2011, um, my 22 year old was a freshman and he was a very gifted skier. So we thought it would be great to start a team back then. It just never happened. Um, Mr. DiLoretto was the interim uh, athletic director at the time because uh, Mr. Devers was on leave and you know he said go put together a budget and go see the school committee and that was his advice way back in 2011 and it just never happened it just we could not get traction back then so um, when my third child finally made it to the high school we said we'd like to try this again and and that's why we're here. I grew up in a skiing family. I grew up in southern New Hampshire, but I actually went over the line to school in Ainsbury, Mass. That was a ski town. My dad would have been 100 years old if he was still here. He taught all eight <coughs> kids in my family to ski. So it's just one of those things. We just wanted to pass it on. And we hope, fingers crossed, that you know we can get some traction here in Arlington and possibly make that some a new thing to look forward to in the history books here too. So I appreciate your time and uh, thank you. Great, thank, thank you. you. And I, I would note that I did reach out to um, Steve and, the, yeah. and a couple of the other people um, suggesting that in light of the current circumstances, it was definitely not necessary or desirable to have a large crowd at our meeting. Yeah. There mm -hmm. were a series of emails that were submitted. Uh, did I, am I the only, only one with a copy? No, oh, okay. that everybody has. Um, in, in, in lieu of everybody showing up at our meeting. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so let's move on to that item now. Um, uh, the vote to add alpine skiing as, an, as a varsity sport. So move. Second. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Schiffman. Yeah, I'm very happy this is happening now. Unfortunately, I grew up on Long Island. <laughs> we don't exactly have mountains, and it's an hour's drive just to get off the island, and then you're in the Bronx. So uh, it's not in my culture growing up, per se, mm -hmm. but I know that a lot of people in town love this. And as soon as we, we started to have kids who were qualifying for tournaments, it, the right thing to do was to, to move forward. And I'm glad we're able to do it. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I'm at a disadvantage because I had to miss our last meeting and also our budget subcommittee meeting. Um, if I cough, I'm not contagious. I saw my doctor yesterday. I'm okay to go in the public. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I had thought based on previous discussion that we were going to do a temporary you know, approval for like a year and we're going to be reviewing how we make decisions about athletic teams. Um, but I'm not hearing that in the motion, so I'm confused. Um, there wasn't any discussion of that at the last meeting. Uh, at, that wasn't my interpretation of the budget subcommittee meeting. My interpretation was that we were going to look into a policy that would be applicable to all sports as to whether a sport should continue or not. So this would be applicable to alpine ski. That policy would be applicable to alpine skiing equally to all, as to all other sports. So, okay. I guess it's so a the, different the way of effect, looking at the it. The net effect is that it's temporary, but then in the same light, then all of our sports mm -hmm. are temporary. Right. I, I under understood the second yeah. thing. It was okay. just, I think it was more, my understanding was that we were doing it more to highlight that we're in the process of thinking about it rather mm -hmm. than it's, I'm just concerned that just doing a flat approval sends the message that it's in. Um, anyway, so we will be taking this under advisement. I'll vote for this because I think it is important that we expand our offerings. <coughs> um, just trying to get some clarification. Okay. Ms. Seuss? Um, so just to follow up on, on what Dr. Alessampi said, I, uh, I remember it similar to you. I also think the discussion actually um, just sort of evolved in that process of the many meetings that we've had. Um, 
that we started out not um, sure that we wanted to move forward, and, and I think we're sort of persuaded by a bunch of things um, that this was the right thing to do at this time, while still also um, saying that we had to look at the big picture. So I, I sort of think, so I think you're absolutely right, but I think that there was my understanding that there, there was sort of an evolution of thought as we were listening to people and talking and hearing different, different perspectives. And I missed some you of You missed that. some of those, right, exactly, yeah. yeah. Any further discussion? All right, close in favor? Aye. 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 Yep. Any abstentions yes. or opposition? All right, unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's all downhill from here. I <laughs> oh. this is mine. I got it, Paul. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So, um, Mr. Mistler is not here. Do you still want to? Um, yeah, I, with the appointment, though, or uh, uh, we haven't actually heard back from him when I've reached out in the okay. last. So I, I think we need to figure out what's going on with him. Okay. Yeah, I Take meant to make a phone call. I've only sent emails. Okay. But, no yeah. problem. All right. So before we move into our other items. Um, uh, in light of the developments today, I thought we would take part of the superintendent's report out of order. Can I get a motion to do that? So move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So I think Dr. Bodie would like to talk a little bit about the events of today and. Is any <laughs> Go ahead and invited. see if we have any questions. That's yeah. right. Um, this has been quite a week, actually, as we are all. Um, in a, in a very fluid and rapidly changing situation, uh, both in our communities and, and across the, the nation. I think our knowledge of the coronavirus and how it spread and, and its um, uh, effect on different people is, is, still in a, is still growing. But clearly there has been a lot more changes and even in the last 24 hours, uh, what we have learned from the Department of Public Health is the expectation of growth that is, that is there. And I think that that wasn't as clear a couple of days ago, but uh, there was this morning a, uh, a panel of uh, epidemiologists from DPH who uh, talked with 22 communities uh, town managers, Board of Health, about about the nature of the the virus and um, you know their concern for the exponential growth that is probably likely. Mm -hmm. So, the we've had a lot of conversations that have gone on with um, different superintendents as well as town managers. In fact, we all had a group call t uh, earlier today, and uh, the consensus was that. If we were going to be helpful in this in this regard and in, in slowing down the viral infections throughout this area, and this area in here is probably the more of an epicenter of for it in a sense because of all of the people that have been uh, at the Biogen conference and living at, at Biogen and living in this area. So we've seen more of this than we ha than there has been in other parts of the state. So that too is starting to change and will probably rapidly change. So we discussed that we probably did need to um, not have continuous exposure both for students in the school as well as teachers. What, what can be an issue, which was something that was not clear on Sunday, it's just been a little bit murky as we've gone through the week, is whether um, people who are not symptomatic could actually be um, able to transfer the virus to someone else. And I still think the science is not complete on that, but they're, they're likely, there's still a possibility. Um, the most common way the virus is, is um, passed is through coughing and sneezing, maybe even talking, what we know. We don't know exactly how long on a surface um, it can remain. That that's. I've heard, I shouldn't even say what I've heard because it's not, it's not factual it's, yet in terms of the research.
But, and that's the other part of it. It's because it's not factual, it, it's sort of hard to um, be, be planful. So our, when I say our, the, the six districts that have um, been particularly impacted have met and talked about this and felt that a two weeks um, uh, just closing, closing schools would at least help minimize, I'm not, it's not, we're not guaranteeing in any way that there's not gonna be spread of the virus, but it certainly <coughs> could be helpful in minimizing impact and the number of people who are sick. And then the issue became, well, once we run, came to this decision, should you wait till Monday, you announce you're gonna have a two week break and then you have school tomorrow and then the more we talked it through, it, this seemed to be the most reasonable, uh, reasonable thing to do. So, I believe that there's probably other districts that are, are in, the, in this Middlesex area that are also considering it. Um, and they, you may hear some announcements to that effect very soon. So there are, are, I have to tell you, it was a very difficult decision because, I, I wouldn't say it's even similar to snow days, it's really not, but the, when I think about calling off school or even a delayed opening or a, a school closure, I do think of all of the people who, who this is gonna be a, a huge burden for. Um, some people can't get childcare. Uh, they have to be in work. They're a, either because, this, because their um, job cannot give them the leave, they don't have the days to do it, uh, or there may even be uh, someone who is, has to have a healthcare worker needs to be in and working. So this is not taken lightly, I assure you. Uh, it was on the four, thinking of all, we were thinking about this quite a bit. And also thinking about um, the suddenness of this, you know, that people were gonna be a little unprepared for it and we realized that. But, we, but when you measured, balanced off, I should say, all of those other issues um, versus the impact that this could potentially have for these communities, we had to go down on the side of doing that. The, does this, this, I assume, includes all our students, including those that are in day programs outside the district? That's a great question. Um, right now, unless the school that the day program is in, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a qualification here. Some of our out-of-district placements are located in uh, districts. In fact, if you noticed the five of the six districts mm -hmm. that are part of this mm -hmm. uh, are the five lab districts and then Winchester. I, I guess my, my concern is we all know, the parents here in Arlington know, as long as those parents are notified, I assume within the lab part they probably are, but anyone that's outside lab. Well, if they're, if they're in a private school that's not part of a school system, so That's the, totally separate, and they will be going to school unless that school closes. It would be the responsibility of that school that they go to to yes. notify mm -hmm. the parents. Like okay. That's yes, exactly. And we, our drivers are, are prepared to, to continue with transportation. So that will continue unless that particular school closes. Thank you. All right. Um, so, there, so that was one issue. Another issue we realize is there is a lot of families that rely on um, the school breakfast and lunch, particularly lunch, and how are we going to um, manage that over a, a sustained amount of time? So um, our director of food services has been in, in communication with Arlington Eats and the town, the town um, department of, of health services is also involved in this and we will be getting out some information about um, how um, extra meals could be available. So we are very much aware of that and are, are, are working on a plan right now. Another issue is that this, was, this was, announcement was made after school got out, though the intent was to try to get it done before school um, was out, but there were just a number of complications with that, that kind of timeline. So um, both students and staff left not knowing and they may have some personal items in the school or materials they want to get. Uh, so what we're going to do is the schools will be open tomorrow from nine to 12 for people to stop by and pick up materials or personal belongings they want to, want to get. 
uh, principals will be in and custodians as well. So I, I it, but it will only be between nine and 12, the schools will be open. After that, in the, in the two weeks uh, going forward, they will not be open. Another issue um, is what about con continuous learning over these two weeks? Um, we are not going to set up a remote um, online system for continuing classes as they currently are. And one of the main reasons for that is equity. We still have students that do not have internet at home, do not have computers at home. There's uh, students that require extra support to do assignments. So what we will do, and we are, we're going to be working on that, in fact, Dr. McNeil and the curriculum leaders have already begun this work, actually a couple days ago, <coughs> and thinking that down the road this may be an issue. Uh, it, to provide um, enrichment activities, resources that parents can have available. And again, we realize that some students um, may not be able to access online. And so we're thinking that through tomorrow. I don't have an answer for you tonight how we'll address that because that's part of the, the plan when we get together tomorrow. So it, it, um, we hope that everyone during this time period can remain healthy and that this, is, this turns out to be a very helpful thing for the community. In the town itself, there, there's a lot of changes as well, and that, that press release went out in which, you know, the library and um, a lot of, a lot of the uh, public buildings will be closed. There'll be skeleton crews in because there are essential services that must be maintained in a community. And so uh, uh, planning is going on to make sure that that, that continues. And um, as, as there are any updates, we'll uh, keep everybody informed as we go forward. But anyway, I, I, I apologize that it had to be happen so quickly, and it was such a surprise to everyone, but uh, on balance, I think it was the right decision to do. Are there any questions? Good decision. Mm -hmm. Very good decision. Um, I just want to make sure our hourly employees are paid through this. We're going to continue to pay everyone during this time period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Morgan? Just one clarification. So is the idea that that we'll, we're, we're going to bump out our four snow days too, right? As well, far as, or, or you're not sure yet? Cause we I am not sure yet. Okay. I, I, I think that the Department of Education is looking at this as more districts do it. I had a conversation with the commissioner today. Um, there is just a lot of uncertainty. In fact, we have, all the superintendents have a conference call in the morning. Mm -hmm. I think DPH is going to be on that call. But I think as this, this is evolving, and, I, and I, a day ago, that's how we were going to operate, snow days. I don't know how that's going to go forward. I also don't know what's going to happen with MCAS as we go forward either. Mr. Hainer? Just to go back, the only precedent related to that is the blizzard of 78 when the state got involved and there were days to make up and not make up. Um, thank you for what you've done. Uh, I think uh, it, it's been helpful. And I, from what little bit I've heard, it has been a positive response. Okay. Even though they, they begin off, we got the kids at home, but uh, they, it's been positive. So thank you. Yeah. Dr. Allison Hampe? Um I want to commend you on how this, how the closure was handled. I think doing it as a group announcement with the six different districts really mm -hmm. made it much more clear mm -hmm. and answered a lot of questions just in and of itself. Um, I wanted also to point out that uh, I'd like us to be sure that we're doing our additional efforts to help flatten the curve. Um, the CDC recommends that if schools are dismissed that, and I know that you said some of this in your email, but I think maybe we want to reiterate it because I feel like when I'm reading on social media, people aren't <coughs> getting these aspects of it, that you want to cancel um, or postpone like after school mm -hmm. activities or, or sporting, you know, basically other extracurricular activities 
and you want to especially discourage gatherings at places like a, food, a friend's house, a restaurant, or the shopping mall. So really what we're trying to do here is keep everybody by themselves. <laughs> Yes, um, I, I said that in my second email today yes, to parents, yeah. that please try to avoid, you know, large crowds. You know, one of the things that was, I was shaking my head is Monday, you know, when we, um, there were some people who uh, kept their children home from school, some high school students went to the mall. <laughs> and so the, it's, the exposure there is, is, is challenging. Now, of course, one of the issues with all of this is that, you know, how is this going to impact our community businesses, too, uh, when people shy away from them? So I think that we have to be mindful of that, but I, it's, gonna, it's going to be an ev evolving story. And the same thing with the mall um, or any kind of shopping. We're not, I think it's best if people do not avoid being around other people and certainly, certainly avoid being out in public if you're coughing or sneezing or whatever because you're going to transmit that. As far as events go, you're absolutely correct. We are canceling all school-related events, um, including tryouts, including the SAT on Saturday. Even though we had a plan yesterday for how we were going to spread everybody out social distance, that, that, that quickly went. Uh, I think one thing that will be the hockey players will be very sad about the, is the hockey game has been canceled. Um, and for those who don't know this, um, our Arlington High School boys team was rated number one in the Super 8 seed and would be in the uh, finals at the Garden on Sunday. So I'm sure that this is a huge disappointment. It's not to say that this won't happen yet, mm -hmm. but it's also, you know, they're going to have to keep their, their game on, so to speak, uh, for whatever the postponement will be. I think it'll be postponement. Could also be that uh, the teams will play without an audience or fans there. That's it's not right. quite the same yeah. thing, you know, to not have your friends there cheering you on. That helps. Uh, but I do think that they're going to want to have a conclusion to this, to the year. I just don't know when it's going to be. Can I just? Oh, uh, yes. I, I just think it'd be good to have some of the information, uh, it, and it may not be just from you. It may need to be in conjunction with the Board of Health or and other people. I mean, really, Desi should be giving us some information too. Um, but we need something that we can refer people back to to understand what the purpose is of social isolation, what the parameters are, and um, just all of the ramifications of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I'm, I'm really happy that we did this in conjunction with other um, districts. And one of the things I said to parents individually is this isolation doesn't really work if just Arlington does it, right? Mm -hmm. So the people are sort of looking mm -hmm. to do that. Um, I, there was one question about play rehearsals. Are those still happening? There was no. a, at some point, you, okay, that's good. Um, I do think it's really important that we um, be very clear about what the science does and doesn't say. Um, the information that parents are getting from places like the New York Times and NPR and stuff like that is that there could be up to a five-day incubation period, so and up to three days on surfaces. Now that might not be that might that's an outside probably parameter, but but that it's very likely that people are contagious before they're coughing. So I think it's just that's the kind of information people are hearing from reputable scientific sources. I think it's really clear that we sort of give messaging that is consistent with that information. So, so mm -hmm. I, uh, have, yeah, uh, we, we certainly will. As we get in more information, I'll keep people updated. Yeah, I, I will say one thing that the should parents should probably would want to know is that we won't do it this week, but the following week before we come back, assuming we do, and I will say that, there may be over the next two weeks um, directives, uh, recommendations for a longer time out. At the moment, we're doing two weeks, but we will have the schools that had not been electrostatically cleaned cleaned before people return. Mm -hmm. Mr. Thielman. Yeah, I want to echo my colleagues and applaud mm -hmm. your decision and the process you went through. My question is, uh, are you having some staff that are going to come and work during this two-week period, some administrative staff, or is it 
is any, are any staff allowed to come in and work? That's one of my curiosity. <coughs> The answer is yes. For example, all the principals will be in tomorrow. Uh, the whole central office will be in, some people up here. Mm -hmm. There will be people around during the, this time. Um, kind of a skeletal crew of people there. It's, it's a stealth crew, yep. yes. Okay, I just, I just wanted to. Uh, skeleton crew. <laughs> <laughs> stealth. Not stealth. Skeleton. Right. Skeleton. Skeleton. Um, so, and, and you're going to continue, obviously, to communicate with principals, and principals will mm -hmm. also message out. I think a piece of what was a little tricky this week is that, um, you know, I saw a lot of different emails from a number of different principals all, you know, trying to deliver the same information, and, but there were, there were some pieces that were occasionally inconsistent, as, as happens in these situations, when there's a lot of information being disseminated in a, in a short amount of time. And I think the advantage of being in a two-week period is that I, I'm hoping that everybody can kind of breathe for a minute, and then, and then we can, that, that, that your team, under your guidance, can circle, make sure that they're talking mm -hmm. to the extent possible to their communities with one voice. And I, I don't think that any of it was um, poorly intended, but especially messaging around what teachers will and will not provide for children over this period of time, what the expectations are, and what parents' expectations of the school <coughs> and the, you know, of the school overall um, and, and their teachers will be. So um, I think that it's so great that I mean, it's, it's hard to say that it's so great to get an email that your kids are going to be out of, first, of school for two weeks during a pandemic, but it was, it was the messaging on the closure was so tight and so clear, mm -hmm. and so I think we're just in a really explicit place right now moving forward, and I think the directions are really, you know, I, I feel like I know what my charge is, mm -hmm. and, and I'm, I really appreciate that, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so yes, I w I'm glad that we did it as a, as a, as a group. That was mm -hmm. much more helpful. I want to express my frustration, though, with the de with State Department of, Gov of Public Health, uh, also DESE, the governor, because this is a decision that they mm -hmm. should be leading. Mm -hmm. uh, if they want to do a regional closure of schools, they should be leading that. And, and to leave each individual superintendent to make the decision is ridiculous. So hopefully we'll see some more leadership step forward uh, in this crisis. And also for the long term, so if we do have to be out for more than mm -hmm. two weeks, um, you know, we as a district, in other states, the districts are huge counties where they've got, you know, 100 people on central office staff, uh, they've got contingency plans, they've got remote learning capabilities, but in Massachusetts, the districts are mostly so small, we, we don't have that capability. So mm -hmm. if we have to move to distance learning, um, we have to wait, to, to, we have to figure out a way to do that that's compliant with special education rules and all of that, uh, we need help to do that. We cannot do that ourselves. So I do call on DESE and our state legislators to start looking into that mm -hmm. so we can start working on that over the next two weeks. Well, you're absolutely correct that um, we have to have some guidance along that issue. Mm -hmm. That's the issue about equity uh, when you do online distance learning. One of the things that we would be prepared to do if we were able to craft it in a way that we were compliant would be for, for students that do not have a computer at home, we would loan a computer out. I mean, we would do that. We, we were, today I was having IT look to see how many hotspots we had. We, we don't even have close to the number we would need. But those are the kinds of things we can have time to look at. Uh, um, one of the things that we had done this week for the students that had been asked to self-quarantine, we, we, we were already geared up to do online off learning, and we, we, we were actually ready to, to go, and, do, and it was happening. The parents that kept their children home that were not part of that group, then that was a different situation that we were exploring how we were going to, um, to, to handle that. But we, we could do it, it's just that it's, it would take some preparation time, for sure. And I think the most important issue is, how do we do it where it's equitable and the, and the kids that need the support, uh, special education support, would have it in those situations. So I think the best thing we can do for the time being is parents, please read to your children. You're going to have plenty of time to do that. And have them read. And, and Mr. Coleman here is from the math department. 
he would say, <laughs> practice your math. We want all third graders to have multiplication tables <laughs> totally <laughs> known, right? By 12. Yes. <laughs> oh, well framed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on to our math update then. Uh, we do have some. Oh, was there no, more? No. Okay. No, no, no. We do have some. It's a little bit odd to be moving on to regular items, but we, you know, on Tuesday when we we finalized the agenda, we were in a a, a different place, uh, and so these prep these uh, presentations have been prepared and. Uh, oh, we're not doing this. And then I was like. We'll go ahead with them. Thank you, Mr. Coleman, for uh, for being here. Uh, and thank you for acknowledging that it is a little weird. Uh, you know, I, I hope uh, some of this is is good information to talk about now. So, um, thank you for the time. I really appreciate it. Uh, just to talk about one thing up front. I grew up in Long Island as well, mm -hmm. and Bald Hill it was open from <laughs> 1965 to 1980 in in Farmingdale. It was a little. Yeah, yeah, it was it was the greatest little ski place in uh, the world. Um, all right, so uh, thank you for having me again. Um, I'll be quick. Um, uh, I'd ask though to keep questions at the end. I'm more than happy to take all of it. Uh, the way I kind of uh, constructed the presentation was just to start big and then to start to go down uh, into more fine details and then to talk about how these details will translate until next year and what we're thinking about for the future. So um, hopefully it will make sense. So this is the, uh, I guess, the middle of my eighth year here. And honestly, the, the one guiding kind of concept that's always um, helped us, it's kind of helped me focus what we're doing, is really supporting all students. Throughout all the years, it really has been creating more opportunities, trying to create more equitable opportunities uh, for the kids, uh, make it so that they actually have the ability to access some of the great things that we have to offer by the time they're in high school. Um, for this year, there were a few other district goals, the formalized district goals that were agreed upon at the end of last year, but there were two that were pretty core in driving what we were doing. Um, this one has been something that we've been really working on for the past couple of years, which is bridging that gap and creating a 6 through 12 CS program. Uh, so this was a goal for us this year, working on that 7th uh, grade unique program and an 8th grade unique program. Um, and we'll, I'll give an update about this. And another one was essentially, um, now that we've pretty much revised and gone through uh, our curriculum updates, we implemented something K through five, we have uh, you know, some middle school work that's been done, we've been working at the high school. What we really wanted to do is to be able to, uh, and I should say also, we have a, uh, the revised uh, re revision of the student as a learner uh, and global citizen from a couple of years ago. We wanted to ensure that our assessment structure, our assessment system, uh, with things that we were collecting and things that we were actually testing reflected what we valued. So a part of the work that we've been doing this year has been essentially thinking about what we value the most both in content and process and then trying to understand how we'd actually go about assessing that with a little sub goal of what it is that what do we actually want to collect. And that very, that's different at different levels, but that's essentially it. I will say this, in the current uh, climate that we're in right now, um, uh, these goals are in a little bit of flux, so uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, these goals kind of translate into a bunch of different action steps, little things that we were trying to actually accomplish. Uh, so at elementary school, uh, we had completed our implementation of the K-5 through program. Uh, we have our coaching team. We're trying to get back to doing more robust coaching cycles. Um, we are trying to think about all of that data that we're actually going to collect. Uh, Dr. Meal had been working on the, and still is working on the data bank. So what we've trying to figure out is, of those common unit assessments, are there certain ones that we want to collect? Uh, of the, uh, like in, in K through two, do we want to have a specific emphasis on fluency? Uh, and what is the most valuable parts to collect so we can actually uh, follow a student vertically through those years? Um, and one little, little part is, how do we actually connect that to the student interventionists that we have at four of the seven elementary schools uh, in terms of uh, monitoring fluency, thinking about push in versus pull out? So that's been the manifestation at the elementary. Middle school, a lot of the work has been at the, the CS program. Uh, I, I feel like I always have to kind of talk about this. I owe such a gr debt of gratitude to AEF for giving us the, the funds to be able to buy so many great toys. That's really helped us refine, build, create a good program for both six, or all throughout now, six, seven, and eight, which has been nice. 
Uh, and then the last bullet for OMS was the, the essential standards and the assessment. What do we value and do our assessments actually reflect that? Um, at AHS, uh, there's been a continuation over the past couple of years of closing down our curriculum B classes due to equity concerns and thinking about creating uh, different types of supported environments in our standard level class. Uh, that's been a work in progress. A couple of years ago was Algebra 1. This past year, we're, we've closed Geometry B. Uh, that's been in conjunction also with a continual revision in both of those curriculums, uh, trying to figure out how we would go about meeting the needs of those students. The other part in terms of meeting all the needs of the students at the high school has been, um, since we have that bypassing program, you know, I'm always trying to plan ahead and make sure that there's that infrastructure in there. The students at the beginning of the program, at fifth to sixth grade a bunch of years ago, this year was the first year they were seniors. So if they had uh, pretty much tapped out and concluded the program of BC Calc, let's say by their junior year, we wanted to make sure that we had some classes and programs at the high school to be able to support them. So this year is our first year of offering a linear algebra half year of course, as well as a number theory half year course. And the, the goal is to continue those. Uh, so that way for all of our students, we legitimately have courses that they can actually take. And one of the greatest things for me, and I talked about the stat last year, I think last year we had 95, 96% of all students in a math class. This past year, it's 98%. So, you know, I know that's at the high school level, but it's one of those things that I think is, is really great because our kids are in math classes. Um, and that's still with just the three-year requirement that we have as a high school. They're still taking these classes, and we have, we have courses for, the, for all students to take. Um, I think I've already kind of gone through this one. Sorry for going a little bit quick. Uh, ask questions at the end. I, I'm, I'm more than happy to ask them. Um, uh, see if there's anything. I think I've already. Oh, I, actually, let me talk, touch on one aspect. I know last year there was the, uh, the, the increase in staffing to improve that common planning time for elementary teachers. Uh, the coaches have been finding that time really, really valuable just to be able to meet with teachers on a more consistent and regular basis. That's really helped with that coaching support at the elementary level. So we appreciate that support um, and planning for that. Um, currently right here, uh, I think I already briefly mentioned the math intervention program. It's at four of the seven elementary schools. Currently right now on the budget ask is to complete the other three schools. So we're really optimistic and hopeful that can happen because the goal would be that we could have a one-to-one -one correspondence with both coaches and interventionists so we could really start to take advantage of that team approach and figure out and uh, be able to support students in, in the classroom, small group instruction, and if needed be like a tier three pull out more individualized instruction. So uh, that's all kind of a work in progress, but we're, we're hopeful and optimistic that we'll be able to round out that staff this year. Um, just some stats on the CS program. Uh, it's increased. Uh, one uh, stat from last year was that out of the 800 and uh, close to 900 students last year, I think we had a third of the students enrolled in CS classes, that elective CS class for 7th and 8th grade. This year we have 40%, uh, which I think is, a, is, which is awesome. Uh, we're trying to offer it, in, offer it in different scheduling options so we can meet the needs of all the students. Uh, but, you know, 40% of students out of the 900, it's pretty great to be able to get just on an elective basis, uh, which we've been psyched about. Uh, one new uh, addition this year has been, and again, AEF has been great for this, we were able to purchase eight Oculus Go's. So we have students that are doing some 3D programming and exploring their own little universes that they create, which is kind of neat. Uh, it's really fun to see. Highly recommend going to like, check out the school and check out the classes and see what these kids are doing. It's pretty fantastic. Um, I think I already mentioned this as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's been... Nice little, nice little shift to the program. Uh, next year, uh, really what we're looking for is a continuation of that time and that work inside those common planning times uh, where the coaches can really get in there and work with teams of teachers as well as individual teachers on their instruction. Uh, we still really want to kind of keep going with the assessment uh, uh, part, to, part of it. What do we value the most and are we actually uh, administering assessments that, that get to that? And then what's the burden and the impact for collecting that data, and then when can we actually look at it? You know, you don't want the, the goal just to be to collect the data, you want the data to be used in a nice, informative, instructive way. So there are a lot of these pieces that are really falling into place, so we just want a continuation of that. Uh, for the uh, interventionist, again, just rounding out those three schools and working with uh, principals, working with whomever would schedule to ensure that we can do both pull out and push out services. Um, OMS. Uh, one aspect, I'm, uh, you know, one thing that always stuck with me uh, at the start of my time here, 
I read this great little article about how essentially curriculum, if you adopt curriculum, it usually lasts for about seven years. Uh, the first couple of years you're implementing, years three and four, you essentially are tailoring it to what you need, but then years you know, five, six, seven, you're essentially moving so far off of what you originally dedicated yourself to, it might be time to actually rethink and rededicate yourself to something new. So we're at that point for the middle school. So for us next year, one of the goals is going to be is to reflect upon the curriculum source that we're using as our backbone and make any decisions from there. So that's going to be a goal that we'll look at. Uh, AHS, uh, in the same vein of that continuation of closing down the curriculum B classes for Algebra 1 and Geometry, the next step, the next phase, is considering what we'll do for our Algebra 2 B class and our quantitative reasoning class. So we have this nice little pathway that's happening between those two courses. So we're just going to reflect upon whether or not we could do something a little bit different, more robust, more connected uh, than what we're offering right now. Um, and that assessment component is going to link uh, into next year as well. The assessment part, in all honesty, is probably going to be a two to three year goal that we're going to work on just because we want to be able to kind of go back to that and revise it and making sure that we're, we're always going back to what we value. Sorry, I went so fast. <laughs> questions. All right. Are there questions? Yeah. Got a question. Great job. Thank you for all the work and effort you put into this. It's really good. Thank you. I uh, mean, uh, we get a lot of support, which I'm very appreciative of. Ms. Seuss. Uh, yeah, I actually just have a comment. I, you've come before us several times, and I'm no. impressed by how remarkably consistent, I think, you know, with changes, your vision has been. Um, and sort of how we keep making progress towards, towards that vision, and I'm very impressed by that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Morgan. I love math. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm with you. I, it's all, like, in my path, because we got it, we just need to move forward, and we got lots of other stuff to do, but I love this presentation. <laughs> it's my, one of my favorite ones. Sam, I'm really psyched about yours, too, because I also <laughs> like science, but I really love math. So thank you for everything. I know when you came here, I just wanted to close the loop. Last year, we talked a lot about the, the fifth to sixth grade transition, mm -hmm. and um, it just, you know, from what I heard, from from parents and from families it was so um, clear about how the support for their kids was changing from the elementary model to the middle school model and they felt you know communicated with and um, and supported and they knew about it well in advance and they understood um, that you know they understood why this was happening and and so I um, I think that that was just so impressively iterated from the first year to the second year, and um, so I really thank you so much for doing Appreciate that. It. Unfortunately, the presentation is scheduled for next Thursday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, well, uh, I don't I, feel good about that. Yeah, yeah, so I, I, I've already started to work on contingencies for it. I, I had a feeling on Monday this past week that what would happen, so um, I'll probably send out an email over the next couple of days just uh, giving an update as to what parents could expect. I'll try to deliver all the information in, in the best way I can. I'm, I'm working on videos. That would be very cool. And you're, but there's not a whole lot. There aren't like major changes. No, not major so. changes. But I think it's an event I actually like a lot because it's, it's good interaction. It's q and I, I, I do it as a presentation intentionally because I think you get that good human interaction. So I'm a little bummed. No, you get a lot of good press after that mm -hmm. presentation. It, yeah, it's, it's a fun time. Uh, with the videos, though, i got to work on um, adding in like uh, Photoshopping a little more hair to myself. I'm <laughs> getting a little self-conscious about that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Schuman. I also want to say you're doing really great work uh, as a licensed math teacher uh, who taught high school math. I, I, I love the the, uh, uh, the movement forward in terms of high quality math, mathematics in the district, and, and, and it's impressive. I want to ask you two questions. Shoot. One, do you know the elevation of Bald Hill? Uh, it's not that high. It's a hill. Uh, yeah. The hill. It's, it's like 480 something. No, 331 feet <laughs> above Listen, sea level. For a beginner, it's a very, very tough. <laughs> no, 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 my, my next question is: Do you know the elevation of the water tower at Park Circle? I, I don't even know where Park Circle is. <laughs> Up by the <laughs> Oh, okay, got it, got it. Uh, probably like 500 and something. 377. So, so the water tower at, at Brack, uh, by Bracken is higher than. I didn't Baltimore. say it was a good place. I just wanted. To, I, I mean, mean they... ski culture. Yeah. Come on, <laughs> if that's your ski slope, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, no, uh, yeah. we're beach town. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I grew up by the water. It was a boating and beach place. Uh, yeah. uh, great job, great job, uh, Mr. Hainer. Great math person. We're not worried about your ski skills. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
Uh, All right. Thank I, you again for the time. Wait, and my I really question. My oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I already go last. Uh, yeah. uh, so <laughs> just on the, on the budget for next year, there's only 0.7 interventionists, right? So how is that going to get spread across the three additional schools? Or Good question. I, I want to say that, so for some of the interventionists, um, uh, two out of the four, uh, they're not full salary teachers because of licensure. Sure. Okay. So it's not as though you need, and for the three that are remaining, we wouldn't need, uh, we're not hiring them as full licensed teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, we will train them. We'll, we'll get them up to speed. So the money that's there, with some other shifting of in some internal money would mm -hmm. cover the three uh, staff members. Okay, great. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Great. That has been Thanks accounted again. for. Yeah. So yeah. I'd like to also thank uh, Mr. Coleman for coming in on this on this night, and uh, mm -hmm. we're very lucky to have him because mm -hmm. his passion for math definitely is transferred to the teachers, which eventually is transferred to the students. So having that type of perspective will definitely help us and lead us into the right direction. So thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Have a great rest of the night. You All right. Too. Thank you. All right. So next is on to science. Good evening. How are you? Good. Oh, thank you. Very good. Hard to follow such I'm going to give you the proper introduction. So this is Sam Hoyle, oh, our new director of science, K-12 science. So I just want to make sure that everyone yep. knew who you were. How could you not know this face? <laughs> so I um, inherited uh, the district goals for science. And I think we have done a really good job thus far trying to achieve these goals. Our two goals relate to student achievement and professional development around those goals. In kindergarten, the goal was to introduce uh, tools of the mind, science mm -hmm. focused. And we had a PD earlier in the school year to make sure teachers had all of those materials, had everything that they needed. We've done virtual check-ins uh, periodically to see how things are going. And um, we are offering PD upcoming for kindergarten just to see what else can we do. Uh, thus far from teachers, what we're hearing is we want more science. Mm -hmm. We want more activities. These are great, but they don't start really until December in terms of their Tools of the Mind calendar mm -hmm. because it's very regimented. Mm -hmm. But they said, you know, we would really like supplemental activities to place where we can throughout the, the beginning of the school year. So uh, in conjunction with teachers, we're going to work on that. Uh, hopefully over the summer and then into next year, pilot them, see how they're going, and then make adjustments based off of that. Uh, just, I, I believe you all have copies of this, is that correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you were to click on the evidence link, it will link you to either what the uh, Tools of the Mind book that we gave out to teachers so that you can see all of the activities, or as we move further along, uh, the evidence will be student work, uh, samples of um, data analysis by teachers based on the common assessments and so on and so forth. So all of that information is there for you to see and take a look at at your own leisure. Um, and then you can ask questions whenever, whenever you feel like it. So in grades one through five, our primary goal was to create common assessments. Um, the way that we're rolling out the common assessments is that we are giving them to teachers, teachers are piloting them, and then in our PD sessions, we're going through them and saying, uh, these are questions that are working well, these are not working well, we need to revamp this, um, and kind of having teacher input along the entire way. One of the things that it says in the goal is to input all of this data into the data bank. We are not doing that this year. We decided because it's a pilot year, we want to mm -hmm. really get the test to where we need it to be to make sure that it's really assessing students on what we want them to know. It's addressing the standards mm -hmm. provided by the state and to make sure that it is a fair and equitable test. So we don't want to jump ahead before we really truly understand what the assessment is. Um, and again, a lot of the professional development has really been around getting teachers together and being able to talk about 
how the assessment is working in their classroom and then being able to discuss with each other and be able to say, this is what needs to happen in order for my student to understand, does this work for you? And really having that camaraderie and the communication between teachers across all seven schools, elementary schools. In grades six through eight, and really six through eight, we're implementing the new curriculum that was purchased. And in conjunction with implementing the new curriculum, what we're really trying to do is to do more PBLs. So project-based learning, where students take ownership over their learning, they have more agency, more voice, and really look at a topic through a lens which is of interest to them, to increase student engagement, to increase uh, research skills, make it more, again, student-centered versus teacher-centered. We want to change it from the teacher being the, sta the sage on the stage to the guide on the side, right? So mm -hmm. um, Mr. Larry Weathers has been doing a lot of work with grades six and seven uh, around PBL. And he's uh, given us the opportunity to go to several conferences regarding PBL. And so I think teachers are really starting to get on board with what this is. It's, it's a very scary thing because we're moving from I'm the content expert to we're going to let students be the content experts and let them present to each other, let them present to themselves, uh, let them create these amazing um, pieces of evidence that uh, I placed here for you to kind of see. And it can be a range of different topics, um, all with an overarching question or overarching ideology behind it. So if you were to look inside of this folder, you, we have uh, natural resources was one of them, climate change was another, uh, earthquakes was a third. So all of those fit within the standards for the seventh, um, for the seventh grade. And so students were then able to kind of pick, depending on what teacher they had, what PBL. In uh, sixth grade, they did an amazing project where they were looking at Mars and what it would take to colonize Mars and really kind of see having each group be a different um, entity of a community and having them figure out what that entity would have to do on Mars to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, at the high school, we're also trying to pilot PBL um, and teachers have done a really nice job of trying to incorporate PBL into their learning into their teaching. Um, we have some different projects at different levels uh, from AP down to bio A and bio honors. So we're not focusing right now on PBL in grade nine because that's our MCAS course. So we're a little concerned. We wanna make sure that we can do PBL and we can teach all of the content um, simultaneously. But there are some ideas out there as to how we could do that. We're just a little hesitant because it's such an important um, year for us. Because again, science is content-based. We are not skills-based. So it really does matter how much content we deliver to students. So we wanna make sure that all of that is done um, and then, then we can really focus on the PBL. Do you have any questions, concerns, anything Mr. that Hainer, I can? You just mentioned about the PBL at the secondary level and first the issue with the MCAS and stuff. Project-based learning, in my experience as an elementary teacher, first off, let me say, I wish I had you as a director when I was a teacher. And well, thank not, you. And having this kind of support, I think it's exciting and fascinating. And project-based learning at, at the basic levels, I think at all levels, makes it real and much easier to learn. So. MCAS, is it interfering, I guess, basically what I'm saying, for the project-based learning? I don't think MCAS is interfering. I think that it's, an, it's a very big culture shift. It's a culture shift for teachers to kind of step back a little bit and say, I'm going to let go of, of all of this control and power. And exactly. Mm -hmm. It's scary. It's it is. very, very scary. But the end, the end result, I think, is well worth it. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. 
but I think it's going to take time for teachers to get on board with that. And I think that teachers feel like if my students do not perform well in M on MCAS, that's going to look bad on me, it's going to yeah. look bad on the district, it's right. going to look bad on the department. Mm -hmm. So my focus has to be MCAS. That's why I'm saying the conflict. So yeah, yeah. so the, the, there is definitely a conflict there. I think as teachers become more confident and more well-versed in what PBL is and what it can do, I think that we can maybe alleviate some of that tension. Uh, and as you met Mr. Petrozino a couple of weeks ago, and I think he is the type of teacher that's going to really be the one that pushes this ship forward. I think he's really interested. We were talking the other day about um, PBL of sending kids out to see on the street to see if they could clock and figure out a way of figuring out how fast cars are going on, I don't know the name of the street. Mass Ave. Mass Ave, thank you, on Mass Ave. Um, and then being able to talk with police officers and say, this is what we're clocking them at. How reliable is our data? Uh, really kind of looking to see if we can find, you know, a, a fender bender that's happened in town and try to calculate how much impact did the cars suffer when they hit? How fast were they going? So work backwards. Now that you know what damage was done, can you figure out how fast that car was actually going? So really doing um, real life things that are within the confines of the curriculum that they're supposed to be teaching, yep. but that takes time and really kind of working together and figuring out how do I get this done while still doing all of these other things. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Seuss. Uh, so, very exciting stuff. Um, I'm very excited by the project-based learning. I know that some students respond really well to it and some don't, and so it's great to have just a lot of tools in your toolbox, mm -hmm. and that's what I really appreciate about the Arlington Public Schools. I think we teachers do, and departments do generally use a lot of tools, and so they get it learning different ways. Um, some of the things that, when I was looking, clicking at it, are different than what, what I would have thought of project-based learning, so I just wanted to, I was just curious about that. Also very important, but some of it looked like someone had done sort of independent research and then made a presentation, maybe in a slightly different way, with a video or a PowerPoint, and that, that feels different than project-based. It also can be, you know, that kind of self-directed work can be very valuable, but it, it feels sort of different than project-based, which I think of more as problem-solving or investigations or something. Um, yeah, so I, I think it all depends on whose definition of project-based sure. learning you're using. Um, for us, it's giving students a voice and giving them an ability to direct their own learning within a specific project or idea. So it could be, uh, I think one of them, like, like I said, the Mars, how, how do you survive on Mars? And, and being able to then have students split up into groups, work collaboratively, which is a huge part of problem-based learning, um, be able to do the research and say, these are the things that a town needs to have. We need to have um, the, a school committee. We need to have... <laughs> Good move. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Need? I don't know. I am nothing if not. Oh, okay. Um, so really being able to see what does it mean or what does it take to make a town run? Mm -hmm. And then how do we make that happen on Mars? Mm -hmm. So in, in the AP, uh, AP Environmental Science class, students had to create their own research project. Mm -hmm. They had to then create a research project, come up with a hypothesis, mm -hmm. do some research, uh, look at their hypothesis and say, uh, based on the research that I've done, I don't think this will work, let me revise it. Then they had to actually design the experiment, go out, collect data, mm -hmm. come back in, say what worked, what didn't work, and then um, present that to the class. And what the second piece of that will be in a few weeks to then say, now that you know a little bit more, I want you to take what you've learned with air pollution and combine it with water pollution and now how do you make something work for both of these mm -hmm. things. So really kind of building on, on each other. So I think it also depends on what level you're at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you tell me? Um, <clears throat> I want to go back to what Bill was saying just so I understand it. Um, are, are you fine? I mean, it, there's a lot going on. There's a lot you guys have done. Um, and so, um, 
drafting common, uh, using new common assessments, using project-based learning. Um, do, do you find that teachers are, 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 are a little overwhelmed uh, or are, are, not, are feeling they can't, uh, they can't get the kids to, uh, to, to uh, reach all the standards um, and be prepared for the next level of science? Or are you, are, you, are you finding that it's working the way you want it to work? That's a broad question, I realize. But. And, I, and you have many teachers that you support, and, super, and so it's, it's you know, a general question. And by the way, I applaud what you're doing, and I'm very much a fan of it. <laughs> so I, don't want to, I do want to think that you're not. I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm just admiring how much, how much goes into changing a practice, a teacher's practice, to meet all of these objectives, and how challenging it can be mm -hmm. for, for you and for the teachers, but how beneficial it can be for students in the long run. And I'm just kind of wondering what the short-term impact is. You get that yeah. question? Or Yes, I think. Yeah, okay. um, so it, it definitely is a lot. I think it is, especially at the elementary level, where a teacher is a master of all, and I applaud everything that they do. It's, it's amazing. Um, there's only a finite amount of time that we have allocated to science, and so sometimes it is a little tricky to get everything into the time that we have. Um, but we're hoping to use the common assessment as a way to drive instruction, as a way to look at our curriculum, assess it, and determine how can we move this curriculum forward. Um, and so the other piece to the common assessment for us at the elementary level is to really have teachers work together, to use it as a collaborative tool mm -hmm. to kind of say, you know what? I can't get my kids to do particle diagrams. Like this question number four on the fifth grade common assessment, I, I just, it's not working for me. My students aren't doing it well. How, but your students, like, it looks like you're doing it really well. How are you doing it? Yeah. How, are you, how are you teaching that? Can you help me? And really to have those collaborative relationships um, within science, and in addition to having the relationship with both the science coach and myself. Got it. One last quick, quick. So there, there may be, it may be, we may see our science scores not where we want them to be on MCAS for a period of time, and this may be the reason because we're learning how to do this, we're learning how to do this work. I mean, I, I think our, our yeah. science MCAS scores are, are pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, um, I don't anticipate them dropping. Okay. Yeah. All I can imagine that they do is they may remain level for a little bit, but then I imagine that they will go up. That's our goal. Uh, and, and our goal is also to create equity amongst all seven schools, to really try to make sure that we're a united team, not an elementary school A, elementary school B, elementary school C, at least at the elementary level. So really kind of making it a cohesive team. That clarifies good work. Thank you for doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Stickman, uh, I want to compliment you on the direction you're going. First of all, one of the realities is anytime you do institute a new curriculum, new program, new teaching style, the associated test scores are going to wobble a little. Mm -hmm. However, the difference between a proficient and advanced or uh, uh, meets and exceeds, th those extra points come from having that conceptual knowledge and being able to express it in constructed response, open response type of questions. So that a teaching methodology that is project-based, where we're asking students to demonstrate their knowledge and explain it, is going to be in far better shape coming into the MCAS than a student who has learned this by rote. Mm -hmm. And that we can tease out the scores on the multiple choice versus the constructive response kind of questions and, and see the growth patterns over there as a way to celebrate the work that's happening. So don't worry about the test. If, uh, if teach your children well, the test results will follow. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really pleased to hear what you're doing. Thank you. And I do think that you know, our tests are changing. Mm -hmm. um, the science MCAS is going to change. This year is, is the first time it'll change for the high school. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and grade eight. Yeah. And I think that as we learn more about it, what we're really going to see, and this is what I've seen on the practice test and what's been given out by the state, is that we're moving away from rote memorization of content mm -hmm. knowledge and it's going to be more the application of skills. Mm 
yes. the application of big ideas, and I think mm -hmm. this is where PBL will really c come into play. And I think once teachers see that, and they're not as focused on, what if they don't know all of the biomes to more, how does this animal adapt? Mm -hmm. How does it en engage or relate to its environment, and how will it continue to survive? So I think once teachers become more, um, more familiar with, with how the test is going to move forward, I think that will also help. Yeah, and, and we've never been more than micromanage on MCAS scores. I mean, I, I used to do this for a living, looking at MCAS scores, and I spend about 15 minutes with the Arlington scores taking a quick look to see if there's anything that's uh, uh, problematic or something worth probing, but we're, we're generally doing well. Um, I'm more concerned with how well the kids are expressing their knowledge and what they're doing with it. And, and it's clear that that's the, uh, the impetus here. Yeah. Um, I'm just really glad you're here. Thank you for picking mm -hmm. Arlington. It's mm -hmm. a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really lucky to have you. And um, science is super important, especially <laughs> right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Thank you. It might just save us all. <laughs> and that's not actually hyperbolic. Yeah. No. Uh, yes, and I want to also thank you, welcome you. I think it was a great first mm -hmm. presentation. Thank well, you. you've presented before, but your first and regular presentation. We do, every year we do ask the curriculum leaders to come in during the year to update us on the schools, specifically mm -hmm. for the purpose of tracking. And you're, you're on track, so great. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and uh, I know you inherited the goals. I, I do think some of them, particularly, you know, doing the data bank eventually, once you get the common assessment, would be a great one to continue. Absolutely. Um, so hopefully you'll continue with that. Yeah, and, and our goals moving forward would be to do that, yeah. to take these goals and continue moving them forward, whatever we did not accomplish, mm -hmm. to really push that and roll that out into the following years. Great, mm -hmm. all right. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And thank I you. would like to applaud Sam on her work that she's done this year. It really has been a seamless transition. She's come in, she's built relationships, and she's been able to, there's been no pause in the work that, in the goals that we have uh, slated for this year. And so she has hit the ground running and uh, we're on track uh, to do some really great things. I'm very lucky. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, Ms. Dr. McNeil, you're up next. Okay, so my uh, presentation is actually a follow-up uh, to our MCAS report that we give, that I give along with uh, Paula O'Sullivan, our district data coach, in the fall. I know that um, some of you had questions as I talked about the way that we disaggregate the MCAS data and like what are the various reports that we. Uh, used from Edwin Analytics, which is the way that the state reports out the MCAS results. So this um, presentation, this will focus on some of those charts that we use, that the coaches use, um, teachers, uh, administrators, in order to look at the data uh, specifically and be able to gauge how students are performing in certain areas. So today we'll look at those charts um, and two of the main ones we're going to look at is the item analysis and standard analysis. Um, and we can also talk about how the released items uh, every year after the spring MCAS in each content area, the state releases various <coughs> items, uh, questions that teachers and um, staff can use for review. And then uh, we're going to, I'm going to just give you a, a peek at how this year's uh, spring test, uh, the test design um, in ELA and math, and um, what that is going to look like, and then I will take any type of questions.
questions or comments, but you can interrupt throughout the presentation if you have a specific question about something. Are there any questions at this point? No? Okay, great. Cool. So when I usually traditionally do the report, uh, Paul and I, you, this is a common graph that we show which uh, lets you know uh, how each subgroup performs on the particular content area and then we uh, report it out by the various subgroups and so that you can see how uh, um, the students in those subgroups are either meeting or exceeding the, um, uh, the expectations for that particular content area. And then we report, report also report it out by grade level. So if we were to, you know, many of the staff members when we first start out, and I also want to add that we use various protocols as we look at the data as well, and the protocols will allow uh, observers to identify certain things that pop out at them from the various charts, and then also we can use it to begin questions and lead us in a direction that will ultimately impact our instruction based upon what those questions are and what those observations are as it relates to the data. So usually we, this is the usual standard way that we uh, report the results. You'll, we'll do the, the colorful graph, but then um, <clears throat> what staff then can go to, and this is a report that's offered, and that's on, that's, we can be found, that can be found in Edwin Analytics, is this is a standards uh, analysis. So in this particular um, content area, this will show you how our third grade students um, performed um, on the ELA. And this is looking at reading and uh, how they were, they also have constructed responses and essays that they have to write um, in, on the MCAS. So as you look across the top, you'll see the different categories. Uh, it, the first category shows the possible points that are, um, that students can achieve. And then you look at how the district performed, the percentage of points that the district acquired, and then how the state. And so the last uh, column shows the comparison between how the district performed versus the state. Yes? Oh, uh, is it? Go ahead. Um, just to interrupt, because you said I shouldn't <laughs> ask questions as sure. I go. Um, what are constructed responses and selected responses? Are selected responses multiple choice and constructed short answer? Is that? Right, those are the question types. Right, right. so is that what that it means? Exactly. What, a constructed is sort of short answer and then selected is multiple choice? Right, and they give guidelines okay. as to what those constructed responses will look like, the short answer, and then the, S, the essay will also be, and typically it's like one uh, written page for the essay that the students have to, and they'll, they'll give you a, a character amount that, you know, ex expected from the student answering those questions. And then you'll have the selected responses, which is generally multiple choice. Okay. So yes, and, and I, that will lead me to a segue into uh, talking about the column on the left-hand side, where you'll see the content area, which is English language arts, and then you'll see the question type, and then they break it down, the, the possible points that kids can achieve for those particular um, uh, question types. And then as you look down below that, you'll see the domain and cluster. And then you'll see the various you know, subgroups in those domains. So as it breaks it down standards-wise, like what you're looking at and how students are performing on those different areas. And so what we try to do is we look at how we perform against the state and so if we see that we're performing um, below the state average, that will alert us to say, this is, a, this is something that we really need to focus on and see why our students are performing at this level, right? And then we can, this is also available uh, by each subgroup. And so today I'm just giving you examples of this because I couldn't give you a report for every subgroup in every grade level. The, the presentation would be hundreds of slides. So I'm just giving you examples of what's available that teachers and coaches look at in order to generate discussion about how they can uh, utilize the data to impact their instruction. Yes. Is all, are, is all the data available to the public if they wanted to drill down to it, or is that something from the state or on one of our websites? I mean, that's a very good question. I really haven't checked. Oh, 
Mr. Paul? The answer is yes. You can go item by item, by school by school. On the state, on uh, the state website. Okay. School and district profiles, assessments. Thank you. And we can also drill down right. down to like to, to individual students. So yeah, there's that, ways that we that can. That wouldn't be public. I, no, probably okay. not. Great. You know, that's what I was going to begin to say is like, I don't know at what point the, the public is, what the Paul, data does that's it stop in. at the school level? The building level? Or? You, you can go into subgroups, but you're not going to be, you know, obviously what you don't want to give out to the public right. are individual student data. Right. But I if see. you have a large enough subgroup, uh, it'll report out. Thank you. And you can do this for any school in the state. Yeah. Thank you. So, yes, yeah, so, but we, uh, as the staff of Arlington Public Schools, we can drill down to individual students. And so you can disaggregate this by teacher. If a principal wanted to look within the school to see how teachers can each classroom compared to each other. So there's many different ways that you can look at this data. Uh, but this, I'm just giving you a general overview of mm -hmm. what's available. So that's a standard view. And then I'm going to also show, you know, I did pull up some charts that looks at each the, of the different um, subgroups. So as an example, so this is how our black African-American students performed in the third grade ELA. And as you can see on the far right-hand side, that that's where you'll see the achievement gap um, start to creep into our conversations because you'll see our black African-American students in third grade across the district and some of the, and many of the areas have uh, performed below the state, yes. Um, I thought the achievement gap was between our student performance as a group and then the achievement of the subgroup. So shouldn't we be comparing it to our, like our average district performance? I mean, I think it's good to compare it to the state too, but mm -hmm. isn't the gap between our district performance? So yes, so your question is, so when I, when I say this, yes, we're comparing it. So let me just back up a second. Like when we pull, if you were to pull up the standards and you and I were having a data discussion, I might say to you, what do you notice? And one of the things you might say is that, oh, in many of these areas, our black African-American students are performing below the state. Then we would look at, okay, now we can go and look at how our black African-American students are performing against other subgroups like our white students, all students. So. I'm saying like the initial conversation might be, be, begin here, but then we would have multiple conversations after that and then multiple comparisons. But yes, you are correct. We do have an achievement gap for how our students perform, black African-American students perform in some of the subgroups compared to all students or white students. <clears throat> but I'm just saying like this is a conversation. So there's many conversations. So if I give an example of a conversation that takes place, yes. They can continue to have that, and hopefully, and we are having those conversations about looking at comparing our subgroups against the subgroups within our district. But this can also give you information as to how they performed against, you know, the subgroup in the state, okay. other black, Af the black African American students in the state. Yes. So, no, I just got, I confused myself. This slide is comparing our district black African-American students to state black African-American students or all students in the state? I didn't look to, no, it must be because they're not the same numbers as the slide prior. Got it, I'm good, thank you. <laughs> good job. I'm not trying good to confuse anybody. Good to ask questions anybody. if you don't yes, understand. Yes, it is. Okay, so, and then this is another uh, sh uh, view of how our Hispanic Latino students, so what I'm just trying to do is I'm trying to give you an example of how we can disaggregate the data using this particular report. And so the conversations are not limited to just one comparison. I'm just saying like we're having all, multiple conversations, but it gives us an opportunity to look at where they, how our students are performing. And this is our ELO students. So again, it's just multiple views of the same report. Yes. Could you just give us an example about a conversation that you would it doesn't need to be a lot of detail, but so you look at the Hispanic <laughs> Latino students, right? And you look and you're like, hey, like things are going pretty great. If you start from the bottom, you got a two and a negative two and a one. And you're like, yeah, we're good. And then you hit this negative 15 on constructed response, Correct. right? And you're like, whoa, Correct. What, what would be some kind of conversation that would happen about that? Well, then, and 
if you could just hold on to that question because I'm going to show absolutely. you some other reports that we can pull up to look at specific items. Okay. So then you can take the standards and you can narrow that conversation and say, okay, now we want to look at our ELL students and we want to look at the, the various item analysis. So the item analysis breaks it down even more so, so you can start to look at individual questions to see how students perform on individual questions. And so they'll break it down and say, this percentage of our subgroup of our EL population or our Hispanic Latino population, this is how many, this is the percentage of students that got this cr question correct, and this is the percentage that did not get it correct. And so then that's how you can say, well, why, that, why is that happening in this specific uh, you know, subgroup? How are we teaching those students? And what are the different things that we need to do in order to support instruction for those students? Okay, I don't know if I answered that question, but just hold oh, on yeah. to that question and I'll show you some other reports, yes. It may be, I may need to defer later, but does it ever get to a point when you're doing your analysis, you realize the possibility that there might be a cultural bias in the question? That too, that's a very good question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you look okay. at the language and you look at the percentage of students to actually get the question right, and then you look at that. But I think, I think you're getting at something there, but you know, we can look at different aspects of the question, okay. I can, right? I'm fine. So then this is just another example. We're looking at our seventh grade math. Again, we disaggregated. This is the traditional you know, graph that I'll show you. And we're breaking it down by subgroups. And then this is an item analysis. And I'm sorry it's so small, but I tried to give a screenshot of what it looks like. And so if you look at this item analysis, Ms. Morgan, if you go back to the question that you just asked, right? Mm -hmm. So you can look on the item. And if you look from the left to the right, in those, if you look at the item number, okay, those are live links. So if you look at number one, you'll see it's, it's blue and it has a line under it. So as we're having our conversations about these items, we can actually click on that item to see what the question is if it's a released item, okay? And then as you look across, you'll see the question type then you'll see the reporting category, which identifies the way that, it, that it's, um, you know, a description of how it shows up in the standards. So if you wanted to go and see what that particular standard is, and then you'll see an item description. You'll look at the possible points for that question. You'll see how the school did, the district, the state, and then the school state differential. So this is from a district standpoint, right? But again, we can disaggregate this and look at the report. We can go by subgroup, and you can narrow it down to individual students. You can, indi you can narrow this report down to an individual class. So you can look at the class, and if Jason, you can sure chime in if you would like to do that. But they can, a teacher can go in and say, how did my class do on all the items on this particular, uh, you know, in this particular uh, content area? And so you can click on that and they'll show you the percentage of the students in your class that are exceeding, meeting, you know, partially meeting or not exceeding, okay? So this is the type of information that will drive us to further our discussion to start linking it to our instruction. And then this is, uh, allows us to have those discussions and say, okay, how, what are we doing within the classroom and how is this connected and how can we adjust our instruction in order to you know, you know, identify something that we can do to support students in this particular area. So this is linking it to the frameworks and the standards. Then after you, after you click on that question, this will show up. And if you look at the top, you can look <clears throat> by subject, grade, you know, all items, and then you'll see again the item identifier. So if you click on that blue item identifier, it'll give you the actual question. And then you'll look to see what item number it is, and then it has the item uh, description, and then it has the reporting category. So where does this show up in the frameworks? And how can we go in and look what the, this question is supposed to be asking? And then where, where are we teaching this in our curriculum? And how are we teaching it? And maybe some of the things that we're doing on our common assessments or the quizzes that we have in the class, are we matching those questions up? Are we having students think about it in the way that the question is asking on the MCAS? So where do we can't make that adjustment in our instruction 
to make sure that we're preparing our students to be able to answer that question. Okay? So the next slide is the actual item. So after you go from here, then you can go here. So this is the actual question. So this is a released item, right? Not all items are released, and I want to make sure that I emphasize that. Only certain items are released because they reuse them. So if you look at the bottom there, this is something you can go back, and you can even use this as a practice question in your class, and it could be like a morning war a, a, a warm-up into the lesson. So you can have kids go back, look at this question. You can look at the language. You can look at how the question is framed, and then you can go down there, and you see you can have students you know, actually take this as a practice, and then you can see the correct response and the score response. So this is how we can narrow it down to individual questions, and this gives us a lot of information. And then again, I'm just giving you more examples of this is eighth grade, what an item analysis looks like for our you know, particular uh, subgroup of black African American students. And then this is our 10th grade. Again, this is a traditional chart that I utilize in my MCAS presentation, and this would be a 10th grade item analysis for students with disabilities. Again, more, this is science by standards, all students. And then this is, this is the way that the uh, ELA test design for 2020, and this is the breakdown of how this is what we're going to expect that the test will look like for 2020. And they released this to teachers so you can begin to get an idea about how, you know, what to prepare for and what to expect in the upcoming assessment. And then they give the grade levels, the question type, and then you'll see right here, um, uh, Ms. Seuss, right here where you see the selected response. Yeah, the constructed response, and then the essays, and then it'll tell you what grades you'll, you'll, you can expect to see that, right? So, and then they break it down for the distribution of points. So they tell you in this section, expect to get this many points, what the breakdown is, and then it gives you the total number of points that will be available that the students can uh, achieve on that particular section. And that ends my presentation. Any comment? I don't know. Did I answer your question about that? Okay, great. Any questions or comments? So, so my question is, as you've been working through this, have there been any big aha mo moments? So this is something where we definitely need to strengthen our instruction for, you know, our tar this target population or, you know, have, have we really reach any conclusions yet as, as you're digging through? Well, I think if you look through, you'll see a theme of, especially with our subgroup uh, population, of looking at the constructive response and short answer responses. Mm -hmm. um, that, to me, seems to be a big area uh, as, it, as it relates to all the, like a common theme that goes through all the <coughs> content areas. Um, but again, if it's going to, and, and, and this also allows principal, because not every school is going to be, is going to have to focus on the same thing. So, you know, as a building administrator, I'm going to I'm going to focus on how my school performed on these particular areas. And then that's where we're going to focus our attention. But again, it's that short response, the constructive response and the essays. I think that we need to focus our attention. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hainer. I'd like to begin by saying I have a bias against this kind of testing for, for students and the time it takes. But do you ever get to a point where you realize a specific question across the board we're not doing well on it, and say to yourselves, well, we're doing so well in everything else, the value of this, putting more time in it isn't worth it. Well, that's an excellent question, because that's why I think by looking to have that state view, because if the state only has like 30% of the population that does, that gets this question right. correct, going to your point, it's just going to be a hard, challenging question. Right. So we'll do the best we can, right. but we know like maybe we're going to focus somewhere else. Right. Because the state's not doing very well on that question, and hopefully the state will look at that and say, well, maybe this isn't a great question for them. My time. concern is sometimes that we, we're spending too much time in achieving a grade and not focusing on the child and the education right. and the end result, and you've answered it well for me. Thank right. you. And, and to be honest with you, I don't want us to be so, you know, I don't want, that's, this is, you know, as you brought it up in, in the prior uh, presentation with Sam, I don't want this to be our focus. Our focus is to provide a well-balanced curriculum in each content area, 
and look at the various skills that students are going to have exactly. to achieve. Um, we want them to do well on the MCAS, but I don't want this to be the primary focus of, of why we're, you know, Education. educating our students, right? This is something that um, will help us to assess where we are, but it's not going to be the focal point. Like, we're not, con we're not designing our instruction around the MCAS. Mm -hmm. Good. Right. Great. All right, Ms. Uh, so I, I think Arlington does a really good job of mm -hmm. um, using MCAS as an assessment tool and not using it as yes. the drive instruction. So I think, I think we do do a good job mm -hmm. of that. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to make a general comment, which is that I get less worried when I see a gap on racial or other things in third grade, and I get more worried when I see it on an eighth grade level, right? So, because you figure, okay, you know, we haven't really mm -hmm. maybe done that much yet with the third grade, especially test taking mm -hmm. skills, which can be um, tricky, but, um, but I do think we have to watch very closely what happens as, a, as students progress and to see if that gap is widening, mm -hmm. are we making any progress, where, where is the problem, um, yeah. Well, I think you I think you hit the nail on the head. I don't I, I would not look like just at third grade. I'm looking back at like kindergarten. I'm looking at this as a continuum and and, and be equally uh, concerned at any grade level if there's going to be some type of achievement gap. So I think that we have to look at what are we doing at at the earlier grades to build a foundation of knowledge mm -hmm. and then why aren't some of our students and, and are we through our instruction implicit bias of in that, and that's why we, you know, focus so hard on like cultural proficiency because we want to make sure that, you know, our expectations is the same for all students. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, maybe that's a symptom of like how the language that we use or the implicit bias that we may have that may come out in our instruction unintentionally. Mm -hmm. And why is that happening? So that's also looking at the material. Are we, you know, representing all cultures in our material in a positive way? Are we sending the message that all kids can achieve? Mm -hmm. And so th these are all the data and the things that we focus on in order to make sure that kids at all levels are going to be equally successful. Mm -hmm. okay. Anything else? All right. Great. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So next on our agenda is uh, approval, vote approval of the transportation fees. Um, uh, Mr. Mason, do you want to present? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So after uh, reviewing the, the the fees and the, the expenses uh, and past revenue and looking at the needs to continue to run a transportation program for uh, more specifically the Bishop and the Gibbs schools uh, it not to completely close the the gap of what we anticipate it would be uh, do this in a phased manner to raise the fees by 22 percent approximately uh, which would increase the single uh, rate for an individual student from $270 to $330. Um, and to also raise the family rate from $370 to $450. Um, with this, the, we looked at how this would uh, look over five years and um, the different plans had different results, but this particular plan uh, would leave a shortfall of about $4,000 versus where we're currently looking at $11,000 shortfall. Um, but uh, we can still operate with these fees. And I would recommend that the school committee would move to approve these fees tonight. So just a little little more background. Do you want to give the background? Or do you... um, oh, sorry. Yeah. As the um, budget committee looked at this, so go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So the budget subcommittee made, is making this recommendation. Um, we've discussed it over a couple meetings. Um, uh, Mr. Mason did present us with proposals that would make the fees, make the uh, buses cost-free to the district. 
Um, and we didn't feel, given the history of the reason that there are buses in Arlington, um, we didn't feel that that was necessary or appropriate. Um, so after some discussion, the uh, numbers that he's presenting here with a $60 per student and $80 per family increase, um, we felt that that seemed like a reasonable thing. The other thing that we did ask uh, that the administration do is in their communications to families that they should be highlighting the fact that these fees have not increased in over 10 years. So this is really mm -hmm. a necessary correction because we haven't been reviewing these fees. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, in the light, you know, 20, 2% or whatever sounds like a fairly hefty jump, but it's because we haven't been doing a 2% over, so. Yes, so I'll, I'll make the motion if oh, we're. Great. Thank you. Mr. Hainer. I'll second it for the purpose of discussion. Sure. I mean, okay. um, saying, and I, I will support the motion based on the fact that it's been 11 years since we've increased it and, and it, it's necessary. Is there a possibility of this being now reviewed on an annual basis and going up every year? Yeah, so we did discuss that. I mean, it is in our policies that we're supposed to be reviewing fees every year, um, and with hopefully with a stable <laughs> CFO, we will we will do that. <laughs> um, I think the intent is probably every two years to adjust this fee, not but we'll, we should be looking at it every year if there's a gas price increase or something. Uh, I just yes. wanted to make that clear to people that, that, that we're not going to wait another 11 years before we right. look at the city. Correct. Mm -hmm. Thank yes. you. That is the idea. Any other comment? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstentions or, or opposition? None? Great. Thank you. All right. Next is the superintendent's budget. Um, just want to quickly go over the minor adjustments that you've made. Uh, yeah. Um, so once again, uh, I, we, <coughs> this budget has been adjusted for some requests that were made at the first presentation. Um, those adjustments include uh, calling out uh, the resources that are being provided to support additional uh, libraries, uh, more specifically purchasing library books. Also with the the, the ski team, we are also calling that out in this uh, particular budget book, which, I mean, this budget presentation, um, which would also adjust the total budget. Uh, so initially, you the, the number, the amount for total that was uh, slightly in the around in the lower 82 million is now 82,997,634. Um, which is reflected uh, in on multiple pages uh, without going into the details on those pages. So now we have an overall budget increase of 6.5% uh, from FY uh, fiscal year 20. Uh, this, there's also slight changes. Uh, if For those that may notice on the proposed ads uh, page, which is page 16, um, in the presentation uh, where it does call out the, the, the library books and supplies. Um, but it also, this number t used to tie, the bottom line number on page 17 used to tie to the just the town appropriation. And we adjusted this to actually reflect the total changes of all funds, which is uh, the net increase for the budget was $5,057,861. Uh, and this will give you a more holistic view of what's really happening uh, in this budget uh, to uh, support the, the district. I'm trying to think what else there. We also then sp spell out the language in terms of uh, how these, uh, these different items support in the, la the latter pages. Uh, we also then made adjustments to the enrollment page which is uh, on page 24, uh, which there's a five-year look um, at the enrollment, um, similar to how we kind of look back at enrollment and do our continuity rate for enrollment projections. Um, 
but th this is just for from the, the October 1 numbers, and it s separates it by school, but as well as calls out um, the out-of-district enrollment as well. Um, I, those are all the, the main changes that are probably worth speaking about. There are other minor changes in terms of uh, different school committee members identifying mm -hmm. spelling errors and whatnot. I have a motion to approve the budget. Motion to approve. Second. All right. Is there any discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Any opposed or abstentions? All right. Great. Budget is approved. Okay. Any additional superintendent's report? Actually, the only thing is really just to get to um, get you up to date on what's happening with the building committee. Mm -hmm. Essentially, since the last time we met, mainly it's committee work that's going on, though we did have a, a meeting on March 3rd, and the, the primary focus of that meeting uh, was a discussion about GeoWells. Uh, at that time when we met, I wasn't really able to bring the issue up, but what is going on is we're still, um, dis we don't know quite yet whether we will actually be able to do geothermal wells. When we did the first trial well over on the practice field, which is over by DPW, when they went down um, 30 feet into bedrock, so they were down between 90 and 100 feet, the, um, they found uh, some material, some, um, we don't quite know what it was, but it's probably coal tar from, the, from years and years ago, which was that area over uh, by DPW. And so that has given some pause. We're going to have to do some more testing. And um, the implications of that is, is not going to be a f affect timeline of the project as much as might going to affect what we're going to do about parking. So we may have to do a change in temporary parking. Um, and um, we were going to have basically there's be three areas where people parked. One was over at the practice field, one on the basketball and then one, of course, on Millbrook Drive. We may have to enlarge the basketball area. So for the time being, this is going to be temporary. All of these things are temporary as we decide what will, what will need to happen. Um, so that's about all we really know right now. At this point, we, we know that there's an issue, uh, and we're going to have to do another test well. We may do a test well over on the current softball field to see if that would be a likely spot for it. One of the issues, though, and where the location of geothermal wells are has to do with the phase of the project. So the idea of the ones over in the practice field was that that could be linked up to phase one, whereas if we did any wells somewhere else, they'd be linked up to a diff the second phase. Mm -hmm. So this is just an evolving uh, issue, and, you know, we, we may still have some. Uh, I don't know if we'll have the same number, um, I, and I all. But one thing that we do know is that the building is still going to be all electric. We're still going to be get, getting um, electricity on the grid through the photovoltaic cells. Uh, eventually, that parking lot over there will have a canopy of photovoltaic, and then there will be photovoltaic on top of the high school too. So uh, it's it's evolving, and that's about where we are. We would, of course, have liked. And we're not saying we're not having them yet, but we just have to do more testing and see where, how many, and, and if the how many, what's the cost, you know, the benefit of doing it too. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if Kirstie and... Um, we're, yeah. <coughs> we're meeting on the 24th. We haven't, we're still scheduled to meet or? Oh, yeah. We'll have to talk about that. Okay, we'll have so. to talk about that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. we are scheduled to meet on the 24th of March. We'll review whether... We still meet, and um, and at that time, we're, we, the, the idea was we would have much more information from the subcommittees and the contractors on the, mm -hmm. this issue, mm -hmm. and possibly make decisions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but otherwise, everything else is going along. Uh, next week, the uh, design team will be submitting the 60% drawings. It's been a, they have spent a lot of time looking at the specifications in, in the interior, and they're continuing to work on exterior. We had a meeting actually yesterday. 
and, and actually these kind of meetings will continue even though we're closed because these are essential meetings. These are not, mm -hmm. they must go forward. Mm -hmm. So that will be happening over the next uh, mm -hmm. few weeks. That's the report on the high school. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's it. Great. Thank you. Uh, consent agenda. All items listed below are considered routine and will be enacted with one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant, warrant number 20219-2020, dated March 3rd, 2020. Approval total warrant amount 13512121. Approval of minutes, school committee minutes on the public hearing on the FY21 school budget and regular meeting dated February 27, 2020. And no trip. So moved. Second. <clears throat> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or, or abstentions? Yeah. All right. Um, so this item, Karen, on uh, officers, is that the item on? Is this just to remind them to give you notice? Okay. So this is the time of year if you are, are uh, eligible uh, for an office uh, next year and not retiring. Uh, <laughs> uh, please give Karen your notice that you're willing to serve. Um, uh, Bill, you had wanted to, to reestablish the Legal Services Subcommittee, so I put that on here. Yes. Um, and you can discuss it. I think that would probably be best left to the next chair. But why don't we just have the discussion? I, I, in going through the warrant, I noticed that the uh, expenses seem to have gone up, and we have already halfway through the year. Uh, it was a, a six-month report on the warrant that I looked at, and the retainer had already been uh, gone through. So uh, I'm not quite necessarily saying there's anything wrong, but I, I think it would be beneficial if that uh, group got together. I'd be willing to serve again, again if I'm reelected uh, on that committee, and. Uh, Basically, it's, it's a monthly review of the uh, things coming in from the, the two major firms that we have, and occasionally there's another, uh, another firm that may be providing legal expenses. And uh, what I had done in the past, uh, Jeff and I looked at it, and uh, things seem to be well within it. I'm just concerned okay. uh, for expenses and stuff, and that's why I'm suggesting. And I have no problem waiting until the new, uh, yeah. the new chair comes in yeah, that makes uh, sense. for a confirmation. <laughs> that's why I just want to share it with everybody. All right, so we'll defer that to the new chair. Um, uh, policy, I'm sorry, the no policy, subcommittee and liaison reports. Budget? Um, oh, I wasn't there. I, I can there. report on our last <laughs> meeting, actually. Uh, so uh, we did meet to talk uh, again about um, uh, athletic fees. Um, there's more work being done on a couple of proposals, um, mm -hmm. so that will continue. Uh, we also met with uh, two members of the Finance Committee. So the, mm -hmm. the Finance Committee has a subcommittee assigned to the schools. There's actually um, three people on it, Dean Carmen, uh, John Ellis, and Jay Poikris, who are all great people. Uh, Dean and John were able to come, um, had some questions about the budget, were very supportive of uh, any, any, any needs we might <clears throat> excuse me, any needs we might have as a district. Um, related to this coronavirus um, stuff, mm -hmm. uh, that there's the, still the res town reserve fund. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Mason said we're okay for now, but who knows what can happen. Uh, and they were very supportive of the budget request and had some mi minor comments and questions. Mm -hmm. So it went really well, right? Ms. Seuss? Oh, I just wanted to add that they um, were interested in getting updates on the high school project, which we were less confident to discuss. And so just to keep that in mind uh, for the FinCom presentation. Um, and I guess we are, we're scheduled to go next week, right? I don't, um, we but, are, but um, I don't know if it's... No. So when I spoke to Adam today, so the, the town put out an announcement today that said all meetings right. were canceled. And I said, wait, what about my meeting today? <laughs> and he said, oh, that's supposed to, it's, it's supposed to say starting tomorrow all <laughs> meetings are canceled. <laughs> but still, um, I, I, you know, statutorily... We're an independent entity. I'm not sure you can quite do that. We'll, we'll cooperate. So I think our next meeting will be canceled. Our next mm -hmm. school committee meeting will be canceled. Um, go ahead. There's only one glitch on that. The Student Opportunity Act. Right, right. the Student yeah. Opportunity Act. I don't know if the, we're going to still have the mm -hmm. same date, April 1st. I don't think that's going to change. Uh, so we, we might have to have a meeting on a single issue. 
which you would get mm -hmm. ahead of time to review. And I, I know we had a curriculum instruction, but that meeting was canceled too. We'll have to figure that. We'll, we can talk offline and see how we're going to proceed. Can we do it all in one meeting so we have fewer? Me I mean, I don't know. We could. That's very possible. Very, very possible. We've been sort of um, sidelined anyway this week, so we're going to be able to work on that um, over the next uh, week. And it's certainly worth asking the commissioner on the call if you get a chance whether that's really a re realistic deadline for right. April 1st. Yeah. It's absolutely. ridiculous that we're focusing on that when there's so much other else going on. Yeah, absolutely. So as of now, we'll, we'll see. We may have a one-item meeting. Um, but basically, I, I view it as the town manager requesting us to cancel as many meetings as we can. Okay. And so hmm. as we proceed, if there's essential business, uh, that should still continue. Um, but otherwise, uh, uh, meetings, meetings are, are intended to be canceled. Mm -hmm. uh, so anything else? There's nothing else on budget update. Okay. Mm -hmm. Policies and procedures? Uh, no report. Uh, CIAA. We're we reported just, <laughs> just <laughs> community relations. No report. Uh, facilities. Uh, met with uh, the Bishop uh, PTO. Uh, it was a good meeting. Uh, scheduling tentatively right now with Thompson is planned for April 8th and uh, Stratton for May 6th. Maybe Skyped. I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, high School Building Committee, we covered. Calendar Committee, or? I, I suspect it's on hold. Yeah. Our meeting yeah. on the 16th of January is, can, is, can, is yeah. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. It is not happening. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I have an election modernization committee coming up on meeting next week, and I also suspect that will be canceled, but yeah. I don't know for sure. Yeah. Uh, superintendent search process. We were scheduled to look at folks tomorrow, but that's canceled. Okay. Uh, negotiations, not really anything to report. Uh, any liaison reports or announcements? I have one, if I may. Uh, the Thompson Mock Town meeting was scheduled for March 20th. It will be canceled, and it has to be rescheduled because those children have got their articles ready. Mm -hmm. We're going to get it done sometime. So, and there's uh, an upcoming one coming from Dallin. Theirs won't be until probably the middle of April. And what I'm really excited about and didn't realize what I was getting into, uh, two 200 student classes <laughs> from the middle school may be doing it. So that, those will be two. Mm -hmm. If we get it off, they will be two actual town meetings. Nice. That will be really fantastic. And I will communicate with Karen and the rest of the committee to invite you to come. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? OK. So my announcement is in regard to our departing member. Uh, we usually do this at our last meeting, but since that's currently in doubt, we moved it up. Uh, Jennifer, on behalf of the committee, I want to thank you uh, so much for your years of service. You've, Jennifer has brought an unrelenting focus to community engagement mm -hmm. during her time on the committee, helping to strengthen the school liaison program, to launch the committee coffees, and to make sure there was appropriate community outreach and engagement on all our major decisions. Jennifer also co-chaired the first Build Arlington Future campaign, has been a steadfast advocate for enhanced funding for our schools and our school buildings. She has helped build bridges all around town to help make the Gibbs the Arlington High School project and the operating overrides happen. She's been a huge asset to the Arlington Public Schools and will be mm -hmm. greatly missed. Thank you. The usual ceremonial I just say chair. something, um, yeah. which is that um, this has been a tremendous group of colleagues, and I think that each of you um, bring different strengths, unique strengths, and I've learned so much from serving here and from each of you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You will be missed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thanks. definitely. In town around this. I, I didn't bring the big car, so I don't know. I know, really. Leave <laughs> <laughs> that here until after the quarantine. Get it yeah. In yeah. April. yeah, we will have it delivered. We will have it delivered to you. You don't have to walk oh, out okay. down the elevator with it. <laughs> yeah, because I brought the really tiny car. But be careful on the delivery. There are no envelopes attached to it. When I left in 2007, there was a nasty note. Ah. It was actually a death threat that I had to forward to the police department. So somebody else had. Put Let's that not in? bring up those memories. Mm -hmm. No, I would. So, so just, just okay. check the box. I hope I'm not hated we by so too many well. people, but. We're <laughs> so we don't, we don't, we don't have a need for executive session. Correct? No. Um, all right. Motion to adjourn. So move. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Unanimous. Yes. No.